everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar on unraveling the law and fracking related litigation. Really happy that you've chosen us today for this very important and I'm sure very educational conversation. So welcome. Um, first, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Prarthana. I'm here with Health the Harm Network um, and our other moderator today is Robbie Desu with Stop the Frack Attack. So just really some quick housekeeping guidelines for today before we get started. Um, the wedding, or excuse me, the webinar will be recorded um, and it's going to be emailed to everyone on the call today and you can share it with others who weren't able to make the webinar. Um, for technical assistance, you can chat Don Artiaga. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can check out the chat box in the bottom right part of your control panel. Um, and you can also email info at halttheharm.net with any questions and your contact information during the webinar if that doesn't work for you. Um, and we'll have someone get in touch with you to help troubleshoot. Um, and last but not least, we'll have a really short survey at the end of the webinar to get any feedback that you might have. We want to make sure that we keep getting better at these webinars um, and we'll make sure to share it with our team and the panelists as well. So again, just quickly how the webinar is going to go. Um, we'll start off with presentations from our panelists today, and uh, which will be followed by a Q&A, an open discussion, because we really want to hear from you guys. Um, and this will be with participants and panelists at the end. Again, if you want to ask a question, here's a really handy visual. Um, on the bottom right, bottom right hand corner, there's a chat. Um, and then you can also email us at info at halttheharm.net if that's not working. So our speakers today, really excited, I'm going to introduce them here. We're super lucky to have David Reed and Hannah Fish from Environmental Action Center. Um, the EAC team has decades of regulatory expertise, um, environmental science and legal experience, um, and they're going to uh, be providing some unique insights into this new tool. Um, Halt the Harm has been working with David and Hannah to explore the tool, which is Rebel Law, and we'll be talking about today. Um, which leads me to our third speaker, Kyle, who is a solutions consultant at Rebel. He'll be speaking to the technical aspects of the tool um, and will also be available at the end for questions. So just a little bit um, about Health the Harm. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Health the Harm is an emerging advocacy network. We're designed to connect, serve, and support the dedicated individuals and leaders working to halt the harms caused by fracking in this country. Um, and our goal is really to expand and, and strengthen the base of leaders and supporters in the movement and facilitate collaboration by developing services to equip leaders um, with the tools and strategies they need to halt the harms of fracking in their local communities and, and ultimately win the fight nationally. So who are the leaders of Halt the Harm? Um, the leaders in the network are individuals like yourself. They're individuals actively working and collaborating to help those living in communities negatively impacted by fracking, or they themselves are folks living in communities impacted by fracking. So a leader can really be anyone, whether you're, um, you're a concerned parent who's organizing other parents at their school, um, or you're a career organizer working for a larger group. And through the network, leaders are able to access free resources, um, some listed here, services online like our leader directory, campaign strategy and support, webinars like this one, um, and event support, just to name a few. Um, and here I have a screenshot, an example of our campaign this year, a national campaign called Raising Resistance that just ended, um, where we worked with leaders who had experienced industry intimidation um, and telling their stories and promoting their current work. So those are just a few examples of things we're working on this year, but we're always looking for ideas and suggestions from individuals and leaders such as yourself. In fact, we're releasing a survey um, at the end of this week where you can vote for new service ideas for us to develop next year. Um, or to suggest your own ideas, so look out for that in your email. Um, some of you listening today may already be a leader, but if you're not one yet, you're in luck. Look out for an email from me in the next week or so, um, giving you access to these resources online. It's completely free, and I'm happy to talk to you personally about any questions that you might have. So now I'll hand it over to Robbie to talk a little bit about Stop the Frack Attack. Great. So Stop the Frack Attack is a national network uh, made up of over 136 member groups from around the country. Uh, we're made up of the big national NGOs like Sierra Club, Food and Water Watch, Earthworks, Earth Justice, uh, and more importantly, small grassroots groups led by frontline community members. Um, we work to gr create greater collaboration uh, within the movement and to find points of collaboration on a national level. 
uh, and to bring frontline voices to the proverbial decision making table uh, and push for strategies that follow their lead. Um, we also help do big national actions. Uh, in the slide you'll see a banner that was dropped at the RNC by some of our activists and then uh, also a picture of a, the dele international delegation we brought to the Paris climate negotiations. Great, thanks Robbie. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, these are three speakers and I'll give it, hand it over to David um, to start everything off. Well, thank you, uh, Parthena and Robbie, and, and to Halt the Harm for having us. We're, we're real pleased to be here. This is David Reed and Hannah Fish with the Environmental Action Center, um, and Kyle Hughes will be helping us out with um, some of Ravel's features. Uh, we've been using Ravel to explore a potential platform for collaborative legal research and ultimately to, um, to develop an institutional knowledge that can be readily shared throughout the Hold the Harm network. So this is particularly urgent in light of recent developments in national politics and, and lack of, of some of that change at the state and local levels. So, you know, we're, we're in need of some silver li linings and we think sharing this institutional knowledge um, can also share some silver linings in, in a lot of the bad case law. So we feel like if the American Petroleum Institute can do it, so can we. Um, our aim is to develop, to develop not just the statutory and regulatory support for our legal arguments and the common law for that matter, but to explore these for the ancillary issues that accompany oil and gas cases. Uh, oil and gas case law. Um, I've heard several people discuss the burnout um, and stalled efforts resulting from all these ancillary issues that come up um, each time communities and local organizations challenge an energy project. So we hope this project is a step towards sharing legal strategies and resources throughout the network. Um, our initial goal was to develop a litigation map for, for those fighting industry pro projects and the damages caused by them. Um, and what caught our attention for Ravel Law was the visual-based platform and the poss possibility of sharing inf this information in an accessible and understandable breakdown of issues like uh, toxic tort and contamination, infrastructure development, and eminent domain, and many other issues that surround the eventual degradation of air and water quality. So we continue to discuss the best way to use Ravel and other tools to develop this institutional knowledge and the optimal platform to share it across organizations and ultimately be able to bring this type of research together so that we can ask questions and share information sort of on a, on a need-based basis throughout the network. Um, so let's start out by doing an introduction and, and Hannah uh, can give us an introduction to this workspace and um, how Ravel works essentially. Sure. Uh, so what you've all been looking at so far is the Ravel workspace. So this is the home screen that you see when you log in. On the left, you see that you have uh, starred cases, annotated cases, and a list of tags that you can create to add to the cases that you've been researching. In the middle of the screen there, you have a list of starred cases. And on top, you can see that there's a button for a report. And Ravel will automatically generate a PDF report of the cases that you've starred or tagged. Uh, that you can then print out or you know forward along uh, to help out others with their research. Um, on the right hand side you see a list of your recent activity. Um, oh here we go. Um, and up top is probably the most important feature. This is the search bar. So you can see that the search bar will prompt you to enter you know keywords, a case name, a citation, a judge, or a statute. If you click on the search bar There we go. If you click on the search bar, you see that uh, Ravel brings down a Boolean guide. Um, so uh, we're, I think we're mostly attorneys here. Um, this is the same sort of Boolean searches you would use on Lexis or Westlaw, but this is really helpful because you can see it whenever you're doing a search. Um, also what's helpful with Ravel is that you can filter by court. So if we go ahead and uh, click on the courts filter, uh, you can see that you can filter um, by state courts, federal courts, federal circuits, federal districts, or uh, you can filter by your own court selections. Uh, so for example, we've seen a lot of hydrofracking related litigation in Pennsylvania. 
uh, so we can click on Pennsylvania and you can see the Pennsylvania state courts will come up. If we click on related federal, uh, we can click on the federal courts that are related to the Pennsylvania courts. So that's a really interesting way to filter decisions, especially if you're working uh, for an organization that mostly works at the state level. So now we can work through an actual search example. Um, so for example, I'll type in hydraulic fracturing. And you can see a list of opinions will come up, but when we get uh, to typing in the entire term, the only uh, search option that will come up will be map cases. And this is the visual feature of Ravel. So uh, what just came up is a visual result of all hydraulic fracturing cases. Um, so on the top, Ravel gives you a graph of how many opinions have cited the term hydraulic fracturing over you know, the past uh, 50 or so years. You can see that there's been a, a strong uptick in opinions that cite the term hydraulic fracturing in recent years. Uh, we have nine opinions in 2011, 32, 52, and 2014, et cetera. Um, on the visual graph, you can see how uh, hydraulic fracturing is cited in cases by courts. So on the bottom, you have state courts. And then if you go up to the middle bar, you have district courts. And on the top, you have circuit courts. And so right now, uh, those are filtered by color. And if you pull down the legend, you can also see how those search results are filtered by size. Uh, by color. And then, for example, if you click on a case, you can see how other cases have cited to that case. So green lines mean uh, that a case is citing that case, and blue lines mean that a case has been cited by that case. So if you look at these colors, these are particularly helpful when you switch into the relevance tab, because you can see how uh, relevant cases have been cited, but you can also see in what courts those most relevant cases have been cited. So moving on, over on the right-hand side of the screen, you have a list of the cases that come up. Um, so these are the most relevant cases at the top, and they go down from there. Um, let's see. When you click on a circle that corresponds to a case, you can freeze the graph on that case to see what opinions cite to that case. And so 269 opinions can be a little bit unwieldy. You can further filter from there uh, by going to the Filters tab and you know, applying either additional search terms. You can search by motion. Uh, you can search by topic. You can also search by statute or a date range. So for example, if we wanted to search by you know, hydraulic fracturing cases that relate just to mining and oil that have been decided in the past 10 years, Ravel can do that for us. So then, uh, for the purposes of this example, um, we've been looking into issues related to uh, trespass. So we can search within the hydraulic fracturing cases found uh, for cases that deal with trespass. And then that will further uh, narrow our search list as well. So Coastal Oil, Ga uh, Oil and Gas Corp uh, v. Garza is a case that we've been looking at a lot. It's also one of the most relevant cases related to uh, hydraulic fracturing litigation. So I'll click on that one. And we can show you uh, exactly what an opinion looks like in Ravel. So up top you have uh, the case name and citation. You also have any tags that you've added um, at your list from your home screen, or you can add additional tags once you get into the case. So these are some ancillary issues that we've been researching related to hydraulic fracturing. Um, if you pull up a case and you want to tag it uh, with a different issue, you can create, uh, create a new tag for that case. You can also star a case so it appears on your home screen, or you can print a case from here. On the left-hand side, you have the opinion history, which shows you how many times an opinion was cited over the years. So you can see, uh, for example, if an opinion has fallen out of favor uh, with courts or with judges, uh, or you can see if an opinion has been cited consistently over the years. 
And then if you scroll down, you can also see how specific pages have been cited. Um, so for example, uh, at the beginning of this case, four other cases, uh, 14 other cases have cited this one page. So you can click on the sidebar and it shows you exactly where else in other cases uh, have cited to this page. Additionally, what's neat with Ravel is that unlike Lexis and Westlaw, um, the footnotes are on the side of the page instead of at the bottom of the page. So as you're scrolling down and reading a case, you can concurrently read the footnotes as well. And then um, when we get down uh, into actually reading a case, uh, we can also highlight material that we uh, maybe want to copy, copy with a citation, highlight, annotate, or search within Ravel. So if we choose to annotate a case, um, that note will show up on our home screen under the annotated cases so we can uh, come back and look at it later. Another neat thing that Ravel can do um, is called Judge Analytics. So let's look at a different case, Bearish, uh, from Pennsylvania. Um, Judge Caputo decided this case, and what we can do, uh, we already have this tab open, is uh, look at all of the other cases that Judge Caputo has authored. So you can see that he's authored almost 2,000 opinions, um, but because he's in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania has been hearing a lot of hydraulic fracturing cases recently, it might be useful to see uh, how exactly he's decided on other hydraulic fracturing cases. Uh, so we can do a search within these judges' opinions to see what other um, oil or gas or energy cases he's written opinions on. So as this is searching, uh, now we can see that he's written 29 opinions that have to do with oil, gas, and energy. And they'll all come up uh, with a judge analytics card that will show you uh, core phrases. Um, and these are helpful because it could lead you to other uh, research terms, uh, how motion outcomes have been decided in the case, uh, some keyword highlights, the ultimate decision, uh, and the summary. It also shows you what other cases uh, this judge has cited to, so you can cite to those other cases you know, in your motions or briefs. Um, similarly, if you look at the judge analytics, you can see what other opinions the judge has cited, and importantly, what other courts the judge has cited. Uh, so if a particular judge you know, only cites to federal district courts, that might be useful um, in planning out your motions and so on. And finally, uh, you can learn more about the judge's personal history and prior professional experience. So that was a very quick tour of how Ravel works using kind of the search terms that we've been looking at. Um, but now I'll hand it over to Dave to talk about more of the ancillary issues like uh, trespass and eminent domain uh, that come up when you look at hydraulic fracturing cases. So, Dave? All right, thank you, Hannah. So uh, that was great, uh, great intro and overview. I think for the next um, 10, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, we'll say, I'd like to just work through some of the ancillary issues or these sort of accompanying issues that go with um, with this type of research. So, for example, we just had a couple of these tabs open. Um, if we were to search for, um, so let's go back and we'll search for oil and oil or gas and energy. Now, as you might imagine, there's a ton of, let's see, there's a ton of case law out there dealing with oil or gas and energy on a general search. It goes way back. Um, I've, you know, sometimes, you know, as most many or if not all of you know, sometimes the extremely old Supreme Court cases still hold. Um, but obviously if you want to break these down, and obviously we're not looking at 33,000 cases on this map, and we can talk to Kyle about this later as far as resolution and how many cases show up and how many cases you want to show up. Um, this looks like we're seeing whatever percent point, point three percent of the cases that are out there. Um, so if we filter this 
for, let's say, something like an ancillary issue like eminent domain, and we only want to look at about 10 years, we can see here, see if I can close this, we can see here the map and we see some of the, um, as Hannah pointed out, the, the larger circles which are particularly relevant cases. Um, and again, as you might remember, we have, you know, this legend shows you that we have circuit court. Uh, here, I don't think I see a Supreme Court, but circuit court, um, district court, and then state courts. So when we go back to courts, we can say, okay, well, let's, let's look at district court decisions. Um, usually, as you all know, you know, district court decisions have a lot of meat and potatoes of standards and review and discussion. Um, they are not these sort of tailored um, appellate opinions based on the record. So let's look at, um, for example, we do a search for, as we're doing here, eminent domain. We're looking at the last 10 years. So, you know, we're search, searching for oil or gas and energy, and then um, with this other issue of eminent domain, we get to see cases that often provide primers on the jurisdictional layer cake of uh, energy production and distribution. So what we could do in these types of searches and what we have been doing um, are searches that look for things like right-of-way, pipeline, easement, uh, if you're dealing with FERC or the Natural Gas Act, you're seeing things like Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. Um, so you're seeing all kinds of ancillary issues that come with that. So in this particular case, this one is a very interesting case and we won't spend too much time on it. You can see that um, it's a single uh, Middle District of Pennsylvania case and it's already been cited a couple of times since 2014. It deals with the Natural Gas Act and FERC jurisdiction over interstate natural gas transport because, uh, as many of you know, intrastate usually isn't, isn't uh, under FERC first jurisdiction, but inter interstate is. Um, so, and natu the natural gas, and natural gas storage underground is considered part of sort of the infrastructure um, for natural gas commerce and transport but it leaves regulation to the states for production and intrastate transport. So um, there are some other cases that, let's see if I can find um, an interesting case that accompanies that. For example, um, Northern Natural Gas, Alliance Pipeline, um, let's look at Northern Natural Gas. So this made it to the circuit court. This is a Tenth Circuit Court opinion. Um, this is a very interesting case, again, because it gives primers on some of the implications. Here, Northern claimed that uh, surrounding production wells were lowering the pressure in its gas storage field, thereby creating a nuisance, quote, nuisance, deciding whether the interference is unreasonable. And this is under Kansas law. But why this is important is, again, these ancillary issues are critical. So some of the work that EAC, the Environmental Action Center, has been doing deals with um, uh, class two wells, so basically wells that are um, either under a state program or, or federally regulated for the class two under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So you have um, enhanced oil recovery and waste disposal injection. One of the big defining factors of that is migration and movement and aquifer protection. And some states actually are more protective of hydrocarbon zones than they are of drinking water, ironically. Um, so this was a really interesting case because the discussion has these implications for migration of gas and fluids because it was a nuisance case brought by um, plaintiffs that were concerned or a plaintiff that was concerned about its natural gas being stored in surrounding wells that were screw basically screwing up the pressure differential. So they were potentially drawing on and creating a nuisance to the owner of that stored natural gas. So it's these kinds of really, you know, and that's something with this visual platform that's extremely helpful because you can see how some of these cases interact with um, cases that have been cited. If I can get these things to work, there we go. So if we go and we click on 
one of these cases, of course, we can map that case and see, you know, which cases have cited to this, excuse me, let's see if I can punch this in, which cases have cited to this particular case. So here we see that since then there have been two cases citing to that. Now I don't see the arrows here, but this means that they are, these two, of course, they're later in time. So they're citing to Northern Natural Gas versus LD drilling. Um, you know, other things that come up, you can, you know, see, look at the constraints of the FERC process and the possibilities for requesting review under that process. You see some, some of the difficulties with um, challenging these. For example, Riverkeeper versus the versus FERC. That's a 2015 case, and it discusses some of the zone of interest barriers for standing um, and jurisdictional questions. So, you know, another interesting way to approach this, and something we've done, is to look at companies and see what some of the companies are doing out there. So, if you're interested in Let's see, I'm going to take my filters off. Let's clear all of these. Now we have 912 opinions if we're just searching for oil and gas drilling. Um, and let's look at the last 10 years. Now, uh, for any of you in Pennsylvania or dealing with uh, fracking law, you'll probably recognize Range Resources, um, kind of an infamous name in the energy industry. And you see there's you know, a bunch of opinions come up. Obviously, Range Resources has been coming up a lot. They've had a lot of complaints and violations. Um, let's open that one up. So we see this one's been cited, maybe not too recently. Um, you can see some of the citations here. If you scroll through the opinion, you'll be able to, you know, obviously like any of these um, legal analysis types of programs, you'll be able to click on some of the case law. You'll be able to click on the statutes, which will take you to that description of statutes. Excuse me, involved. Um, when we see something like range resources, what we usually do is we'll you know, on Google-based searches, we'll go to the SEC website for that company. You know, you look at some of their reporting. Um, you can just look for all the subsidiaries. Um, there are some interesting cases that show up on a, on this search for range resources that discuss things like um, some of the contracts and, and uh, rules for construction, contract construction in Pennsylvania. Um, Basically, what they need permitting um, and that and those types of uh, uh, contracting with engineering firms and other subcontractors and landowners for these drilling activities. So you can learn quite a bit just by doing this type of map-based search to look at some of these companies. Um, so again, if we want to drill down to another ancillary issue, we'll look at for example, drinking water. So we can do another search for oil and gas drilling. Let this computer. Okay, let's give this a moment. That was pretty fast. And then we can look at something like, for example, the Safe Drinking Water Act. Now, of course, it may not. There may be an action that's covered under state law, but for a moment, let's look at this. And we do that. We look for the past 10 years, and we see six opinions jump out. So here we have an interesting case. Not a good outcome for the plaintiffs, but it's interesting, and you can see that Hannah has tabbed this already for water and hazardous waste. But this was a contamination case, and while not a good outcome for the plaintiffs, it provides the evidentiary standard for showing that a water, um, well, a water well has been contaminated by oil and gas drilling, and you can look at how judges 
you know, how they're looking at these. And of course, um, it would be very helpful if you get, you know, something in, you know, federal court where you can look at how a or in Pennsylvania, um, common in a court of common pleas, or in this case, the Commonwealth Court, which is one of the appellate courts in Pennsylvania. Um, how they rule on these types of cases. It doesn't have to be an energy case. It could be any kind of toxic tort case. Um, so here, you know, it was a unfortunate case. You had a battle of experts and, you know, whose experts were better and were better and who laid it out better. Um, so that's really, this is a good way, I think, to navigate this um, and something that will be important for reports, which we'll go through later. And then I'd like to finish up just looking at some of these ancillary issues by talking about something that um, Maya Van Rossen brought up at a meeting I was at recently um, about the importance nationwide of these sort of state constitutional amendments that talk about the public's rights to whether it be clean air, clean water, um, or just generally clean environment. Um, Pennsylvania's is particularly protective. Um, it's also self-executing, so it's it's one of the more powerful ones. Um, but let's just see if we can take off all of our filters. Do we have any? Did I put this in right? Start over on the search so I can give you an overview here. And we'll take our filters off, and I hope that will bring up all of the opinions I expect to see. Um, okay. So this is better. And we'll look at relevance and not court. So you can see there's a ton of opinions. And you can also see around the time that these um, cases started coming out, again, you may need to look at a shorter time frame to get all of the resolution. I don't think I see 381 dots up here. So sometimes you have to look in a time frame to bring them up. And again, we can have Kyle talk about that. But you see here that one of the earlier cases um, coincides back in 1973. Um, Pennsylvania's is, as I said, particularly strong, but you'll see a lot of cases in Montana. Um, Hawaii has its own constitutional amendment. Um, and they're, you know, regardless of the name, I think right to clean air or right to a clean something environment is the way to search for that. So these are, you know, if, whether you're looking for Pennsylvania's environmental rights amendment, um, that's, by the way, Article 1, Section 27. That's been critical in a couple of recent cases, um, and it can be a critical argument to use down the line, uh, depending on the power of that constitutional amendment. So as we do this type of research and we look through some of these and we use Ravel to, to use this sort of visual platform, um, and this judge analytics function, which is extremely useful, you know, in our in, in the research we've done so far, um, we have developed some sample reports. Um, and so, well, here's a good look at judge analytics, which Hannah showed you earlier. This is for Richard Caputo, and this is just a printable version. It goes through his decisions, um, what he ruled on, a summary of the decision. Um, and then what we've done is cobbled together some of these reports that look at not just the case law. So as you can see, I hope, um, and I'll scroll through. Um, you can also highlight, and this is something that we'll put together, you can highlight particularly relevant case, a case or cases. Um, and then we, and we can put short summaries on those. And then, of course, we can do some judge analytics, use judge analytics to look at how judges are ruling in a particular um, jurisdiction. So that's obviously incredibly important if you have a potential case and you need to know what the field looks like um, for judges that are or may be ruling on that. 
So based on your feedback and questions, our goal is to customize approximately five Ravel reports um, about, so it's probably maybe more, but let's make a, a floor of five. So we'll have some of our analysis and it'll include an overview of the relevant case law, one or two particularly relevant cases, and then a close look at judge rulings using judge analytics. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over maybe um, if we have questions for Kyle. A couple of things that sort of are, are things that I wouldn't mind hearing him explain are um, the categories that you see when you look at Ravel. Um, I think Hannah picked out mining and oil, but so obviously here as Hannah said you can look for different types of motions, you can look at different topics, statutes, but um, you know if we click on something like environmental law, constitutional law, what's that algorithm look like, you know generally, how is it delineating cases, and then again as Hannah and I pointed out, when you look at a particular case that is cited to, um, we can see on the left as Hannah showed you who's citing to it, how many times it's been cited, um, and then how it's been cited, and which I think is probably more useful than traditional, we'll call it, you know, let's say shepherdizing or key citing because sometimes they can be wrong. You know, you see a negative treatment, but it may be a very narrow negative treatment or positive treatment, but there's something in there that's um, narrow and not good for you as far as the case law goes. So if Kyle could talk a little bit about that, but um, with that, I think I will um, turn it over to Parthena um, for anyone, uh, if she has any comments or suggestions for how we might move forward with the Q&A. Sure. Um, really quick for folks who are joining in via computer, um, everyone should be muted now um, as an attendee, but if you have a question, uh, make sure to raise your hand in the bottom right hand corner. Um, there should be a small hand icon. You can click on that to raise your hand for a question. We can unmute you or you can chat it to us um, in the chat box. Um, so yeah, so if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and try those two options right now. Or if folks are joining in via phone, um, you should be able to unmute yourself um, and, and ask any questions. Um, so any questions that you have for David because of, uh, for his presentation, or for Hannah, um, or for Kyle, and just kind of understanding the tool and, and other aspects of it. So what we can do is um, maybe as folks are thinking about the presentation and thinking about some questions that they might have, um, we can I can hand it over to Kyle to go through some specifics. I'm sure he's worked with um, other groups as well who've used this tool and, and can think of some kind of frequently asked questions. Uh, sure. Yeah. You know. Once again, everyone, uh, thank you so much uh, for letting me join today. So probably the best way to go about this is just to, you know, I, I don't want to repeat anything that David or Hannah has said, but, you know, I, I can definitely uh, run through a couple search examples. I've kind of been jotting down some of the, the questions that David has been, been raising along the way, and we can certainly address those. And then, you know, as, as, uh, as we go along, if there's any specific questions, feel free to interject either by speaking up or by shooting us a quick uh, instant message, and we'll kind of just go in that fashion. So let me share my screen. Okay. So here I am back again at our workspace. Um, I really don't, I, you know, once again, uh, you know, props to Hannah. She did a really quite a thorough job uh, going through everything. So I don't think there's anything here uh, that, that needs to be uh, reiterated or, or clarified. Looks like we might have a question pop up. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so it looks like uh, Gillian asked, what are the advantages of signing up or logging in? Great question. So this brings us to pretty much, uh, if you will, our, our levels of subscription, I think is maybe where, where this question is going. So when you create a Ravel Law account, you utilize uh, an, a, a username, which is your email, as well as a password. 
And when you sign up, you get uh, one week of free, uh, a one-week free trial of our advanced level features. And what advanced level features are going to include are the search visualization, so the lines uh, and bubbles that are connected in the search map, as well as the case analytics. So that's going to be the star reading system along the left-hand part of the screen as you're going through a case. Uh, so, so that's what you get when you create a Ravel Law account. And after that, um, after that one week period. Hey, Kyle, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify. Um, so since this is definitely a pilot project that we're still figuring out, um, how okay. exactly to best use it for folks, um, one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit afterwards before we sign off um, is that we'll be developing a form for leaders. So Jillian, that's one thing that we'll share around for people. So that way it'll be easier so we can help people with the account. Um, okay. as opposed to having folks sign for accounts. So yeah, so that's definitely sure. something that I think we're thinking through, um, but that's one of the options that I think we're going through with. Okay, okay, that, that makes sense. Then, you know, I won't, I, won't, uh, I guess, go, go too deeply into that then. But, right, so, so really what you need to do to use Ravel is you need to, at the end of the day, you're going to need an email address uh, and create a password, and at the very least, you can have unlimited uh, and, and absolutely free uh, case law reading. That's part of our, I'll, I'll give a, a slight plug to our our Harvard Law School digitization project that's in tandem with, uh, with Harvard where they're digitizing their law, their entire law school library, and part of that project is to, to make the law open and accessible to folks. So uh, creating an account, you get unlimited case law reading at the very least. Uh, that was a question somebody had asked. So unless I see something else pop up, I'll kind of just run through things again. So, you know, obviously here we do have our um, our workspace, very nice to you know, be able to customize your research work, uh, being able to easy, easily and quickly navigate and, and, and retrieve things. Uh, getting to a search here, let's see, we'll just do, we'll just do the topic of the day, I suppose, just to get something going. And we'll address some of these, kind of these questions that, uh, that David had raised. So. First and foremost, when you're looking at the search visualization, you're only going to have the 75 most, the 75 top re most relevant cases on the search visualization map. So uh, it's, it is a common ask to have more bubbles or less bubbles. Uh, it's certainly something our product team is looking into. And you know, the, the theory is, is that one day we're going to be able to expand the platform so that essentially a user would be able to see how many bubbles they see. But currently, uh, it's, it's going to only be 75 bubbles at one time. So hold on, I just got an alert about a potential question. Okay. Um, and then let's see, and obviously along to the right-hand side of the screen is your traditional list of cases. Um, let's see, so I, I, I think David had posed a question about our filtering. So. The really exciting thing for us here at Ravel is the, the motion filter specifically. Currently on the market, there's really no other tool where you can uh, essentially filter an initial list of search results, search results by motion. It's something that we're getting a lot of buzz over. Um, our users are, are, are very jazzed about it. They're very excited to use it. And you know, we've really only had that feature out for uh, about six weeks. So we're getting a lot of great user feedback from it. Um, and you know, it's it's definitely um, among some of the other analytical tools that we do, we do around here. It's definitely something that's getting a lot of attention. So those are going to be straight motions. Um, right now, uh, we are picking up about 95 different and unique motions, and uh, it's it's really exciting to to see the continuing use cases develop based on motion filtering and motion searching within case law. The the top. Uh, let's see what we got here. So Kyle, actually, I, I do have um, a question here, and okay. um, I think this is for everyone. So this is for David, Hannah, as users, and also, I guess, for Kyle and for yourself as someone who's worked with the program. Um, just in your opinion, how do you think this database holds up next to the more popularly used databases, um, consuming like Lexis? What are the big differences? So I guess yeah, this is a question yeah. for And, and, and I'll tackle that yeah. one. It's, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. I'm actually glad, glad it was raised. So. Part of our, our Harvard digitization project, our effort with them, uh, what, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're digitizing, and you know, uh, you know, I'd be happy to share uh, perhaps with somebody else to, to share with the larger group, but 
They're, they're going through volume by volume, cutting the spine off the book, feeding each page into a digital scanner, and then essentially digitizing their entire law library collection. So Harvard Law School has the second largest collection of US case law behind the Library of Congress. So once that project is complete, and uh, we only have about six months remaining, it should be early spring, uh, or sp early to mid-spring of 2017, where that project's going to be complete. So once that is finished, we are going to have, we're going to feel very comfortable saying that within the Ravel corpus is complete, a, a, you know, completely comprehensive case law going back to the beginning of each state's um, incorporation into the union. So for example, out here in California, uh, the first reporter begins at 1850. Obviously in some of your East Coast states, uh, some of the first colonies, obviously, we, we are, we're also picking up some of the early colonial case law as well. So from the whole historical end, we're going to be completely comprehensive, and by the time this project with Harvard is complete, we, are, we feel more than comfortable saying that we're actually going to have more comprehensive case law than even a Westlaw or a Lexis. Um, looking at the current and future end of things, we provide a daily, uh, or, or rather, uh, w each Monday morning, we, we would provide a weekly update of case law going back to the prior week. So come uh, the start of business, Monday morning, 8 a.m. on the East Coast, uh, you're going to have complete, uh, up, completely updated and comprehensive case law. Hopefully that answered that so, question. So if I could jump in real quick, um, Kyle. So this has been, and, and, and for everyone listening, I, you know, Kyle's been super helpful. He's helped us along the way just talking through how this is like and unlike other um, legal analytic, analytical tools. And it's actually more similar than I had originally thought. It takes a moment, like anything, to get used to. I was I preferred Lexis, but I used I used Westlaw. Um, and yes, you know the cases. So the resolution thing is not really an issue. It can be an issue. So I, I think that would be something interesting to answer when you look at the map. You know how many cases do you want to see? Obviously, you can't look at thirty-three thousand um, because you just see you know a big colored screen and you wouldn't see anything else. Uh, so that would be interesting if you want to narrow it down and see as much as you can. The other issue I think that's worth noting to users, particularly um, attorneys, and this is something that's true of every legal tool, which is administrative law. So that's something that, you know, Ravel, I, I don't know what their choice is on this, but that's um, a critical component of environmental regulation. Most smaller, even medium outfits don't have access to it because it's so expensive through Westlaw, Nexus, whatever whatever it might be. Um, but that would be extremely helpful. Um, but we, you know, we've had luck using it. Um, I think, the vi again, the visual platform is super helpful. Um, I think as far as use with Halt the Harm Network, you know, what I would like to see from the network, um, and it's something that you know, between um, Marty Kearns and, and Parthena is um, how we start to build this um, institutional knowledge and how we start to build this collaborative process to start sharing this, um, which will be, you know, Ravel I think will be extremely useful in how we do that, but I think, you know, what's going to need some, some startup is, is how we share this and how we really build that institutional knowledge so we can share the, these tools effectively and so that anytime somebody has a question they can kind of pose it to the network and get a um, something that's tailored to their need instead of, you know, I discussed earlier burnout and I think this will really help with that so they can get an overview of, you know, the jurisdictional layer cake of, of some of these energy cases. Um, and Hannah, I don't know if you had any other questions or, or thoughts on on the platform. Yeah, um, I thought the visual platform was very different than um, the other kind of legal uh, analytics tools that I used, and I I really appreciate seeing things differently. I don't think I've done I've done hydraulic fracture, uh, fracturing research on other platforms before, and there are cases that I found on Ravel that I wouldn't have found on. Uh, Lexus or Westlaw just because of the visualization tool. So I do think that's helpful. Um, and, and there are different platforms. You know, I, yeah, I would, I, I'm sorry, I was just going to briefly interject to, to David's point. Um, 
Well, actually, both to, both to Hannah and David's point. First of all, with David, uh, well, he was saying, you know, that's something we're we're trying to build out in the platform is the collaborative nature of of its use because increasingly we get we, we get those asks, and you know, obviously, with the, you know, uh, the first step was the report building. Uh, you can, as in essence, quickly and easily generate whatever it is uh, you've you've searched and, and the results you found and save it as a PDF and share it with your colleagues. And then also too, throughout Ravel, uh, you're you know very easily uh, able to take the, the the URL. So take the web page you're on, copy that URL out of the address bar, and then you can send that in an email to to a group. So we definitely are trying to build out uh, the collaborative nature of the platform, and that's definitely a uh, a work in progress. And it's, and to Hannah's point. I know that is what our users are telling us time and time again is that especially thanks to the search visualization field they are finding cases that they have that perhaps they didn't find with another tool uh, we have you know several users who have been practicing the same area of law for 25 30 plus years and they still like to use Ravel just to make sure you know as, as one of our customers puts it he likes to boil the ocean he likes to make sure that there's nothing out there uh, that that might surprise him or might come as a as a curveball, so to speak, in the litigation process. So you know, the, 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 these are cases that we're 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 finding time and time again. So that, that that's what I wanted to, to add there. Great, thanks so much, Kyle. Um, so if if last call for questions, I guess um, we're getting close to our time, but just wanted to see if anyone else had any questions and just make sure to um, raise your hand. Um, but if not, um, you know, this isn't the last time that you can ask questions. We will be sending a survey around to folks afterwards. Um, that'll be more than kind of your basic survey. Um, it'll ask you, you know, particularly around the tool if this was interesting for you or not. But we are, um, this is a screenshot of the form that we've been working on. Um, like David mentioned, we are launching the pilot service where we're going to have custom reports for up to five leaders using the, these tools. So I'm going to be sending this around um, in the next couple of days, if not tomorrow. Um, and, and this is just a sample, but you can submit what kind of information you're looking to get from the tool, and, and we can work with you one-on-one -on -one, um, to figure out how we can best utilize this to the specific case or the specific issue that you're working on. Um, so, again, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Fortunately, that's all the time we have left for today. We do have a, another um, webinar, which is basically the same webinar for folks who couldn't make it during the day at 6.30 this evening. So um, let your friends and family and colleagues know. Um, and if you have any questions that didn't get answered, again, make sure to include it in the comments section of the survey that we'll send around. Um, you'll get a separate email once this webinar ends. So I just want to thank everyone, David, Hannah, and Kyle, for sharing with us their findings um, from Ravel. And, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us um, and participate. And shoot me an email if you have any webinar ideas. Um, my email is not on here. Actually, it is info at haltheharm.net. Um, we do these throughout the year, and we're always looking for new ideas. Um, and you can check us out at haltheharm.net, stopthefrackattack.org, and you can also check out environmentalactioncenter.org. So thanks again, um, and we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar.